Morning, Riverbend. I am so ready to hang out, and I'm so ready to watch a musician and play some bingo and listen to the pastor band and, and eat some chips and stand outside where it's 187 degrees. But most of it's inside, so, so, so I'm, I'm stoked to go hang out together today. It's a good day. But I have to ask a question before, before we go. And, and it's a rhetorical question. And the question is, what's the matter? What's, what's the matter? Maybe, maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm the only person who, who looks around at, at, at our community, who looks at our, our culture, who looks at our world, and, and, and wonders what in the wide world of sports is going on. What is, what is happening? Maybe I'm the only one. I have a hard time watching the news anymore or, or reading, reading stories online because if it's not a story of tragedy or disaster, it's a story about people tearing each other apart and, 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 and people pointing fingers at each other and accusing one another and just tearing one another down. And, 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 and I got to the point where where I don't watch the news anymore. I just I just watch the weather because it's hard to it's hard to then that hasn't even been good for the last couple of months. I mean I, I think I think the world is losing its collective mind. And I'm not sure whether humanity will survive. When you see headlines like this, these are actual headlines that were printed in newspapers. This one says State population to double by 2040, babies to blame. <laughs> really? This is news? Here's, here's another one. Here's another news, breaking news headline. Breathing oxygen linked to staying alive. <laughs> Groundbreaking stuff. Here's another one. And, and this is, I think this could be true in Austin. Bridge closure date, Thursday or October. <laughs> 360 to be done. This year or before Christ comes sometime. Uh, number four, uh, most earthquake damage caused by shaking. There's scientific breakthrough. And then and this one, miracle cure kills fifth patient. <laughs> We're doomed. It's, it, 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 it's just over. And it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you are on, everybody is complaining. Everybody is upset. If, if you're a progressive or a liberal, the world is not liberal or progressive enough. If you're a conservative or a traditionalist, the world is not conservative or traditional enough. The only thing that we can agree on anymore is that it's someone else's fault. It's like we formed our culture into a circular firing squad. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. So what do we do about it? Is there hope in a world that seems to have lost its collective mind? I want to suggest to you that yes, there is hope. And there is an answer to the question of what's the matter. And the answer to the question is right here. But before we pull the curtain back on that answer, I'd like to pray for a moment. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to remind us of our hope and to challenge us to see everyone we meet as someone who matters to you. Pray that for myself, and for my family, and for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, if you were here or if you watched online, you got a chance to meet our student ministry pastor, Ren Harpole, and, and he did a marvelous job last week of introducing us 
to his personal mission statement, which happens to be the, the mission statement that you could say is the mission of Riverbend Church. And I thought Wren did a fantastic job. Did you appreciate <laughs> Pastor Wren? And, it, and it's not just because he introduced us to the wisdom of the Apostle Paul in the letter to Corinthians. It's because his life incarnates that mission. What he introduced us to was a section of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it begins down in verse 19, where the Apostle Paul basically says, even though I am free... And I belong to no man. I am not a deeded piece of property. I am not a slave. I am, I am not just an object to be used. Even though I am free and I belong to no man, I have chosen to make myself a slave to everyone just for the possibility that I might make a difference in their life, that I might influence them, that I might connect with them, that I might win some. To my Jewish friends, I, I, can, I can do Jew. I can, I can become like a Jew. I'm familiar with that. And I do that just so I can connect with and influence my Jewish friends. To those who are, who are under the law, to those who are, who are stuck in their traditions and, and who, are, who are conservative to a fault, to those people, I become like them. I become under the law, even though I myself am am not under the law, I become under the law so that I can influence and connect with and perhaps even win some of those who are under the law. To those who have no law, to those who live reckless and boundless lives, to those who are antinomian and agnostic and polytheistic and atheistic, to those people who have no rules and no conscience, I can live like that, I understand them, I can live as one who has no law, even though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. I do this so that I can connect with those who live without the law, those who live apart from the rules and the regulations that many of us follow. For those who are weak, I can become weak so that I can win the weak. In fact, I become all things to all people, so that by any means necessary, by all means possible, I might save some. I might bring hope and redemption to some. And I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, so that I can be a part of something greater than myself, so that I can share in its blessings. In this passage is the answer. It is the answer to the existential crisis that we are facing. Now, I know it has become fashionable in, in rhetorical circles to call something an existential crisis. Perhaps you've heard people refer to things as existential crisis, and some of that is unfortunate because it's just a rhetorical device. Because there's a difference between a crisis and a problem. A problem is something that begs to be solved. A problem is something that if, if you change behavior, you can fix it. There is a, a remedy. If there's a really dangerous stretch of road and people are getting in accidents and people are injured and some people are killed, that's a problem. But there can be a solution. You can change the road or you can put up guardrails or you can lower the speed limit or put in speed bumps or, or place officers to, to protect the, the, tr the speed of the people on the road. Problems are solvable. A crisis is a different thing. A crisis is a moral issue. The difference between a crisis and a problem is a crisis says if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. If you are not working to, to make things better, then you are, by your absence, making things worse. That's a crisis. A crisis has a moral component. It has a, it has a question of morality, because not dealing with the crisis, you are contributing to it. 
And then to raise the bar and call it an existential crisis. Well, that's to, that's to put it in the realm of, of the supernatural because by definition, something is existential when it's without limits. It's without definition. It transcends our understanding. And once you make something an existential crisis, then you leave the, the, the area of logic or reason or, or, or even, even science and you enter into the realm of the spiritual. When we're talking about an existential crisis, you're playing on my turf. This is a spiritual issue. And what the Apostle Paul suggests is that there is a solution here in these brief verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to the existential crisis that all of us face, and that is an existential crisis of meaning. What is the meaning of our life? What is the purpose? Why am I here? These verses answer the existential crisis that every human being faces is that what is the meaning of life? Does my life matter? And the Apostle Paul says, yes, it does. In verse 19, he says that I, I choose to have the life of, of those who are around me matter to me. Because those people, those people who I meet matter. Whether they are Romans, whether they are Jews, whether they are Greeks, whether they are slaves, or whether they are free, they all matter. He says, my Jewish friends matter to me. My legalistic friends with a, with, a, with a stick up their backside who can't change for anything, who, who are bound and, and enslaved by their rules, they matter to me. To the people who are antinomian and agnostic and atheistic and polytheistic, the people without the law, people who live outside of the rules, who are unconventional, who are difficult to get along with because they're such contrarians, they matter. The weak and the poor and the marginalized and the disenfranchised matter. In fact, everyone matters. They all matter. We matter. Now, this is not an easy thing to comprehend. And, and it's not an easy thing to comprehend because, because if we're saying that everyone matters... And everyone matters to God, then they should matter to us. But the people are such jerks. And people are such idiots. And people are so difficult to get along with. You mean to tell me that even the most difficult person matters? Even the most disobedient person matters? How can that possibly be? How can I possibly care? How can I actually possibly... Every person I meet think that they matter. Well, it's in verse 23. It's for the sake of the gospel. You know what the gospel is, right? The gospel is a simple story. It is the story of the birth and the life and the teachings and the sacrificial death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The gospel is the story of the redemption of mankind, the hope of mankind. The gospel is a simple thing. But what the gospel says is, you matter to God. Everyone you meet matters to God because they are worth dying for. Now this is, this is not, this is not a, a hypothetical thing. It's actually a parenthetical. It's, 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 the rationale is parenthetical. It's, it's what the Apostle Paul says is an equation. And he includes it parenthetically in verses 20 and 21. In verses 20 he says, he says, To the Jews I become a Jew that I might win the Jews. And to those under the law I become like one under the law. And then he says parenthetically, even though I am not under the law. This is not something that you do out of obligation. This is not something we do because we have to. It's something we do because we choose to. Because if others matter to God, then they should matter to us. 
If they are worth dying for, they should matter to us. And it's our choice to see them as valuable, to see other people as people that matter to God. But then in verse 23, he makes this amazing statement. He says, even though I am not free from God's law, because I am under Christ's law. What was Christ's law? It's real simple. Jesus made it easy. You know what it is. It's in Matthew chapter 7. It's called the golden rule. You know what the golden rule is? Do unto others as, what does it say? You would have them do unto you. The golden rule. It is the law of Christ. Do unto others because they matter as you would have them do to you because you matter. In Matthew chapter 22, there was, a, there was a legal expert, a Harvard law professor, who came to Jesus and he said, Oh, young rabbi, you're so smart. Tell us what is the greatest commandment of all of God's commandments. And Jesus quotes directly from the law. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And then he said, but hold on, there's a second one that's equal to it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because everyone matters. But you see, the secret there is in that second quote. You know what it says? It says, love your neighbor, what? As you love yourself. You see, if your neighbor's worth dying for, and the people of the world are worth dying for, if the innocent and the vulnerable are worth dying for, you are worth dying for. I think this is where it begins. I think this is where we find our meaning when we realize that you matter. Our life matters. You are worth dying for. It's the hardest thing for us to realize, and it's the most powerful thing for us to actualize. I don't know if you see it, but I see it all the time. When I see people raging in the streets, when I see people screaming and, and, and yelling at, at other people and condemning other people and judging other people, and, and when I see critical spirits, I see it in myself when I have a tendency to judge others, when I, have a, when I have a tendency to criticize, what is surfacing in me is, is fear and insecurity. And sometimes what is being expressed is shame and guilt. But what I see when I see our culture tearing itself apart, I see people who are filled with self-loathing. I don't think my life matters. I, my life has no meaning. And out of that pain comes the rage that pulls our culture apart. The solution is right here. Right here in the promise that you matter. That you are worth dying for. And when I say it's right here, I mean it's right here. It's here. This is the laboratory. This is, this is the Petri dish. This is the place where the proof of concept is that we matter to each other. We matter to each other because we matter to God. And that proof of concept, Jesus talked about in John chapter 13. He said, this is my command that you should love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you treat each other like you matter. Right here, in this community, this is the proving ground. This is the place where it begins. This is the meaning of this place. This is why this matters. This is why we matter. This is why you matter. This is what it's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I believe this is what Pastor Wren was, was showing us, was introducing us to what his life incarnates, that students matter, 
that his wife matters, that his children matter, that his ministry matters because they matter to God. And what he was highlighting for us last week was this introduction, this invitation to incarnate the answer to the existential crisis that we all face, the crisis of meaning. Does my life matter? I don't know. I don't know if you are like me and you live day to day and you watch the news and you're like, we are in trouble. <laughs> this ship is sinking. I think every generation thinks that. Every generation thinks, well, it can't get any worse than it is now. I guarantee you my grandparents thought that. And their grandparents thought that. In some sense, we're going to be okay, but we're only going to be better if we understand our hope. If you just look at the news, which I can't do anymore, really, it, it, it feels like we're doomed. You get stories, you get stories like this. Like, even if you just watch the weather, it gets political. Here's a, here's a headline, it says, forecasters call for weather on Monday. <laughs> you think? Here's another one, check this out, read it very carefully. Mississippi's literacy program shows improvement. That's not how you spell Mississippi. Here's another one. <laughs> this is my favorite. Amphibious pitcher makes his debut. It's ambidextrous, not amphibious. Thank you, Tabber. And then there's this story. This is an actual story. A goat was accused of robbery. Now, if you read the story, this is what it says. Police in Nigeria are holding a goat on suspicion of attempted robbery. Vigilantes seized the black and white goat, saying what it was an armed robber who had used black magic to transform himself into an animal trying to escape after trying to steal a Mazda 323. A spokesman for the police said, the goat is in our custody. Vigilantes saw some hoodlums attempting to rob a car. One escaped, while the other turned into a goat. <laughs> There's some breaking news. Maybe I'm the only one that wonders whether or not we are doomed, whether or not we are going to make it through another generation. Maybe I'm the only one who wonders what is the meaning of our life? Does my life matter? I'm here to tell you today on the promise of the authority of God that you matter, that you are worth dying for, and every person you will ever meet matters to God. This is what's the matter. I can't wait to hang out with you because it matters.